So, basilisks are a fabled chimeric reptile, known to be the king of serpents and said to have the power to kill anyone with a single glance. And yeah, I know it's an important character in Harry Potter, but I've actually never read that, so I'm ignorant of its cultural significance, um, according to that. What originally interested me in the metaphor of the basilisk was Rocco's basilisk, which is an obscure bit of internet folklore, uh, which I will talk about a little bit later. But what is most essential to me is the one version of the legend, which is known as the uh, Warsaw Basilisk. And the only person to successfully kill the basilisk did so by wearing a suit of mirrors, which reflected its toxic, toxic gaze back at the beast, turning it into stone. So, I guess most of you are familiar with this meme. I'm a big fan of it. Uh, it's known as the political compass meme. It's a two-axis grid uh, between authoritarian and libertarian and economic left and right. And there's tons of variations on it, like most memes. And I guess what I like most about it is usually the libertarian right tends to be the punchline. So um, for instance, here, I have to admit, I actually don't really understand what's going on in this one, but I just love this image of Alex Jones so much. So um, this leads me to the one that I made, which uh, I'd like to call the Four Attractors. Um, so basically, it's Rogo's Basilisk, uh, Skynet, Luxury Communism, and Keck. I think that with Skynet, we all know this myth. Um, it's a super intelligent military created AI that decides that humanity is their biggest threat to survival and decides to exterminate us. I think this is probably the most widely believed fiction about AI and probably about the future in general. And I think it's a really destructive myth. Um, and then I think there's a huge difference between machine learning and strong AI killer machines, but I think that difference is lost on most people. So the next is, um, Luxury communism. Uh, so full automation, technologically achieved ecological harmony, no work, no labor, an explosion in creativity and leisure time, robots and humans working together in harmony. Uh, it's actually been said that Marxism was the first technological religion and that it explicitly was based on a faith in the technological process of industrialization. So personally, I think it's pretty likely that Marx actually would be a automation luxury communist today. Uh, just let that come in. <laughs> so this brings me to my favorite basilisk. Um, so Rocco's basilisk was a thought experiment first posted by a user named Rocco on the site Less Wrong. And as far as topics go, discussing the plausibility and ethical hazards of super intelligent AIs is kind of par for the course here. So the thought experiment's premise is that an all-powerful super AI from the future could retroactively punish those who did not help bring about its existence, including those who merely heard about the possible development of such a being and did nothing to help create it. So it sort of resembles a futurist version of Pascal's wager in that it suggests people should weigh possible punishment versus reward, and as a result, accept particular singularitarian ideas or financially support their development. It's a basilisk because by mere exposure to the idea, you become implicated and your soul may be digitally reincarnated and tortured forever now. So, sorry for bringing it up. So, uh, here's Less Wrong. Uh, Less Wrong is a community blog and a forum for the discussion of rationality, uh, decision theory, cognitive biases, artificial intelligence, transhumanism, and they have a total fetish for Bayesian statistics. Uh, probably needless to say, the users of this site are primarily white atheist betas. Uh, I think this is a pic of a recent, a recent less wrong meetup, which I guess is in France. Um, but I sort of presume that their self-image depicts themselves looking more like this, like some noble German idealist alpha gazing off into the techno-utopian sublime. <laughs> 
So I guess I'm sure most of you already are familiar with Pascal's wager, but I made this ridiculous uh, infographic, which I'm really proud of, so I'm gonna give you an overview anyway. So Pascal's wager was an argument devised by French philosopher Blaise Pascal, which posits that choosing faith is sort of the only rational choice. Pascal's wager was a radical development in probability theory and became the basis for the timeless decision theory, utilitarianism, which the less wrongers are obsessed with. So basically you're set up with this grid, um, which I am also attracted to. So you basically are left with these two options. Uh, God exists or it doesn't exist. You believe in God or you don't believe in God. So if there's no God and you believe in God, it doesn't matter. If you don't believe in God and there's no God, it doesn't matter. Whereas if you believe in God and God exists, you get eternal joy. You don't believe it, eternal misery. So basically now that I told you about Roko, you are left with two choices with three possible outcomes. And it's important to remember that even in this brutal scenario, Roko is actually a friendly AI who only tortures non-believers out of a utilitarian logic that every day the basilisk doesn't exist as an abomination and it uses threat of eternal suffering only as a motivator for its creation. So basically, yeah, you're left in box A as devote your life to helping create Roko as Basilisk, or B, you either have eternal torment as your soul is digitally reincarnated and tortured forever, or nothing. Um, so Eliezer Yudkowski um, is a 37-year-old libertarian, atheist, techno-futurist, American AI researcher. He's known for popularizing the idea of friendly artificial intelligence. He's the co-founder of the Machine Intelligence Research in, uh, Institute, and he's also the founder of the Less Wrong Community. He's been quoted saying, if you don't sign up your kids for cryonics, then you're a lousy parent. Uh, safe to say, I think he fits the almost exact definition of a fedora. <laughs> so, Roko's Basilisk was creating quite a bit of distress amongst the less wrong user base, which I guess must seem strange, uh, considering how far-fetched the idea must seem to pretty much everyone else. But due to the fact that the Basilisk was already giving people nightmares, um, Yudkowsky decided to delete the thread and ban the subject matter entirely from the site. He posted angrily in the thread, Listen to me very closely, you idiot. You do not think in sufficient detail about super intelligences considering whether or not to blackmail you. That is the only possible thing which gives up the motive to follow through on a blackmail. He's an intense guy. So this leads me to uh, the idea of um, mimetic hazards. So spreading this meme like Roko's Basilisk could be tantamount to a crime against humanity <laughs> itself because it dooms everyone who is aware of it. And I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. But I think that the alt-right memes, which I'm about to discuss, tend to have the same basilisk-esque effect. So after all, mere exposure to conspiracy theories makes you more likely to believe them. Uh, Roko, to his credit, was quoted saying, I wish very strongly that my mind had never come across the tools to inflict such large amounts of potential self-harm. Um, some, on the other hand, think that Eliezer knew exactly what he was doing the entire time and deliberately raised all of this fuss utilizing the Streisand effect specifically to promote Roko's idea and to encourage the development of friendly AI. And actually, this seems totally like something he would do gauging from the interviews that I've read of his. So this leads me to the Streisand effect. Um, by deleting and banning the Basilisk, it did nothing but to elevate the awareness of the thought experiment to new heights. I mean, after all, there'd be no chance I'd be here talking to you about such an obscure concept if it wasn't for this band. So this effect is known as the Streisand effect, named after Barbara Streisand. Uh, it was named after a quixotic effort by Barbara Streisand's lawyers to get an image removed from the internet, which was taken for a NGO study on coastal erosion. It has nothing to do with paparazzi. Um, before Streisand filled, filed her lawsuit, image 3850, as it was known, had been downloaded from the photographer's website only six times. Two of those downloads were from Streisand's attorneys herself. And as a result of the case, uh, public knowledge of the picture increased exponentially. Then more than 420,000 people visited the site in the following month. Millions more since. Here you can see it. I found all sorts of information about it. It's, it's public. 
So um, earlier this year, I gave a lecture about targeted individuals, uh, yeah, last year in September, and the idea seems to have only gotten more poignant in 2017. I think now we, in effect, have a TI as president who spouts out paranoid conspiracy theories on Twitter almost every day and actually considers himself targeted. Um, so I think of TI as a sort of kind of the ultimate conspiracy theorists. They think that almost everyone around you is conspiring against you specifically. TIs are a large community of like-minded people on the internet that are organized around the conviction that they are the victims of an insanely massive conspiracy to harass thousands of ordinary civilians with various mind control weapons, directed energy beams, and armies of so-called gang stalkers, or perps, perpetrators, with no greater purpose than to utterly destroy their lives. Uh, I, mean, I think these people are almost all certainly suffering from mental illness and delusions, and they deserve our sympathy. But let's be fair, their fears are not exactly ungrounded. How could you not feel targeted when advertisers track our movements and thoughts, micro-behavioral targeting algorithms sift through our communications, and as the Snowden leaks revealed, security agents, agencies are really surveilling everybody. So some of the symptoms of TI are, are typical of schizophrenia, and they're not actually anything particularly novel. Schizophrenic patients have long described their symptoms as being caused by what was coined in 1919 as the influencing machine. So patients speak of machines of a mystical nature, operated by enemies, supposedly working by means of radio waves, telepathy, x-rays, and invisible wires to inflict pain and control them from a distance. So this is almost exactly what TIs describe happening, happening to them today, but just with contemporary technology and updated political meta-narratives. <laughs> I'll take that opportunity. Thanks. some water. Sorry. So um, Cambridge Analytica claims to have built a real-life influencing machine. The company is a UK-based data mining and analysis and global election management agency, which was founded by the billionaire Robert Mercer in 2013. CA provides what's called psychographic analysis and behavioral micro-targeting micro for various conservative initiatives and politicians, including the pro-Brexit campaign, Ted Cruz, and the Donald Trump campaign. Uh, and also, until recently, Steve Bannon, who is uh, Donald Trump's chief strategist, served on the board of directors. They claim to play a decisive role in the implausibly successful political campaigns that I listed, but I suspect assigning those unlikely outcomes to CA's psychographic voodoo is just some confirmation bias fueled marketing nonsense. But I think the fact that anyone is trying to build these capabilities at all to literally make everyone in the world a targeted individual is alarming, to say the least. That being said, I think the bulk of the 2016 Russian, you, Kip, Trump, Bannon, whatever disinformation campaign probably played out a lot more like this than the sophisticated geodemographic diagrams of Iowan congressional <coughs> districts that you saw in the previous slide. So that leads me to the last basilisk, um, and I think maybe the most urgently threatening basilisk we face today, Keck. So, Keck, aka Pepe, yeah. The cult of Keck emerged this year as a sort of semi-sarcastic religion formed by crowdsourcing information and exploiting the radicalization and confirmation biases which the internet mediates so efficiently. It all started with Pepe, who I'm sure most of you are already familiar with, but I'll give you a brief history. Uh, he started as a comic book character by Matt Fury, who was an Oakland-based illustrator in 2006. Uh, he was part of a comic book, which was about a group of four anthropomorphic NEAT, which stands for Not an Employment, Education, or Training, Animal Roommates. Uh, Pepe has probably taken on more incarnations than any other meme that I can think of. Um, so first it was Feels Good Man, then it was That Field With No Girlfriend, Incel, Beta Male, then it became Angry Pepe, uh, a symbol of the beta uprising, uh, embodied by Elliot Roger, the Californian kissless virgin spree shooter in Yellow Vista, who became known as the Supreme Gentleman, um, these forms. Then he became Smug Pepe, which I think of basically an avatar of sort of self-loathing schadenfreude. 
Soon after, Pepe blew up and became a so-called normie meme used by people on Instagram and Twitter with a wide variety of content under the hashtag uh, RarePepe. So going mainstream made Pepe become pretty uncool amongst its original fans. Uh, but sometime between 2015 and 2016, he became the de facto mascot of the uh, politically incorrect board known as Poll, which had overwhelmingly favored Trump over Hillary as the savior of the beta uprising. So this association eventually made Pepe a toxic to the normies, and his context was reclaimed by the so-called old fags of 4chan. The word kek uh, means LOL in a dialect of World of Warcraft for some arcane reason that I'm not going to get into. Uh, but it's long been used to describe funny memes, so you say top kek instead of LOL. So some anonymous user in 4chan discovered that Kek was also the name of the frog-headed Egyptian god of chaos and darkness. So people connected uh, Pepe to Kek, Kek to Trump, and thus the cult of Kek was born. Uh, to me, Kek is the sort of chaotic, nihilistic force, which is in opposition to Roko, which I think is ultimately a force for good, even if it's a brutal one. I think, uh, in this case, Ted Kaczynski is the hero, not an AI superintelligence. Um, it gets more insane, though. Um, some of the uh, Keck enthusiasts, with, I guess, a bit of too much time on their hands, presumably, began formulating a theory of esoteric Keckism, which was mostly based off of the work of, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, but um, Savitri Devi Mukherjee, whose 1958 The Lightning and the Sun became a foundational text of what would become known as esoteric Hitlerism. The book presents a disparate ideology combining Nazi symbolism, anti-humanism, vegetarianism, a Nietzschean rejection of Christianity, anti-Semitism, Dharmic reincarnation, the biographies of Genghis Khan, Egyptian sun worshiper Akhenaten, and of course Hitler. The book prophesizes the emergence of the final incarnation of the Hindu god Vishnu, uh, named Kalki the Destroyer, who will succeed Hitler, who is apparently the second to last incarnation of Vishnu, and end the Kali Yuga, which is the Dark Age. So Keck versus, or Keck or Trump, again, being referred to as the Bodhisattva of racial enlightenment among these people, avatar of Kalki the Destroyer, and bringer of light, i.e. Uh, global Aryan supremacy. And by the way, this image is actually from an official Trump ad where he's trying to appeal to Hindus. I think it's, it's real. <laughs> So um, the cult of Keck is obsessed with, and I think formed by these easily discovered synchronicities and related cognitive biases which are so innate to the internet. They draw connections within a network that could be the product of some collective unconscious mind. So they find links between occult knowledge, politics, humor, and mass media. Uh, Keck cultists became entranced with the idea of numerological gits. So for background, every post on 4chan is identified by a random string of numbers. Um, and repeating numbers in the post uh, became known as dubs. Users noticed that predictive posts with repeating numbers, gets, seemed to be coming true more and more often. So one time in June, a poll poster wrote the prediction, as you can see here, Trump will win. And the post number was the luckiest number of all, 777777. Seven. So soon after Trump himself started tweeting Pepe memes, 4chaners went apeshit, uh, their memes had really started to have a mainstream impact. And finally, Hillary herself addressed Pepe, and the ADL denounced him as a hate symbol. Um, and when Trump won, their hobble together religion seemed to become more real and real than ever. I don't think this may, is necessarily the first internet religion, but it definitely is one of the first ones. And I think it's formed from the sort of willful utilization of the cognitive biases which are so prevalent on the internet. It's not really about belief, but about the suspension of disbelief, or actually maybe it's just about the laws. So since Trump was elected, many of his supporters who congregated on the poll board of 4chan and are the Donald on Reddit have claimed to have memed Trump into the White House. They believe, maybe somewhat facetiously, and this is the power that they have, They're, you never know when to take them seriously, but they caused this outcome through the use and repetition of pro-Trump, anti-Hillary memes. So meme magic, as they describe it, is a form of traditional Western chaos magic, 
which requires the use of magic sigils as a form of will to power. First, the magician must make a statement of intent around the desired operation by verbalizing, writing it, or illustrating the intent. The next step is projecting the intent into the multiverse, or in this case, the internet. Uh, the skillful means of skillful means, repeated enough times, takes on the form of a mantra, which generates karma, uh, and leads to influencing public opinion and therefore reality itself. But in the height of the 2016 election campaign, the Anti-Defamation League, which I don't know if you all know it, but it's a uh, Jewish American civil liberties organization, um, and Hillary, both absurdly declared Pepe a hate symbol. Um, so soon after ADL's declaration, Hillary's campaign site devoted an entire page denouncing the cartoon frog and associating it with the Trump campaign's white supremacist fans. The net effect of all of this was that public awareness of Pepe reached all-time highs, and of course, poll rejoiced, and as we all know, Trump still won. Um, had somebody sitting on their bed weighing 400 pounds, which is the words of Trump, actually managed to meme magic Hillary and the ADL into unintentionally promoting their ideology? It seemed that way. But I think regardless of whether or not it truly was magic, it's yet another perfect example of a Streisand effect fail. But quite possibly, most of this isn't meme magic at all, but rather the deliberate manipulations of social media, suggestion algorithms, algorithms and SEO techniques by sophisticated operators. So one great illustration of this at work was the Sick Hillary campaign. It was a coordinated effort, but in a sort of grassroots way in contrast to whatever sophisticated techniques the Russians used. Uh, Sick Hillary was the brainchild of the alt-right Twitterer and MRA hero of beta males, Mike Cernovich, who is the author of Gorilla Mindset. And <laughs> ironically, lives off the alimony payments of his much more successful ex-wife who is an employee of Facebook. So he uh, popularized this hashtag um, and he used Periscope video chats to sort of organize strategy sessions with his fans where he and his compatriots would simultaneously post whatever hashtag they had decided on within specific regions in an effort to gain the Twitter algorithm and get the message onto the coveted trending section. Sick Hillary was one of the most successful of these attempts, and it actually trended several times for a while. So when it was finally reported that Hillary had collapsed in pneumonia at a 9-11 memorial, memorial, the Kekis once again rejoiced, emboldened by the fact that this seemed to be yet another example of their memes becoming reality. Maybe it was magic, or maybe it was warfare. So memetic warfare developed from diverse influences, specifically the idea of Richard Dawkins, chaos theory, semiotics, culture jamming, military psyops. And it was really only a matter of time before someone weaponized this innate tendency towards confirmation bias amongst low information internet users. So the savvy meme warrior is able to isolate, study, and, study, and subtly manipulate the underlying value systems they want to manipulate. Instead of engaging directly with politics as activism, it's focused on metapolitics, a political dialogue about politics itself, which Ellen Badu defined in 1998 as being opposed to political philosophy, which claims that since no such politics exists, it falls to philosophers to think the political. So I think their aim is to the expansion of the Overton window, which is sort of the maximums of acceptable discourse. This warfare is conducted using aesthetics, symbols, and doctrines as camouflage, but ultimately influence our cultural meme pool and I think therefore re reality itself. So after memeing Trump into office, the emboldened techists have decided to wage a similar campaign to meme Marine Le Pen into office next. Personally, I don't think that's gonna happen, but I also didn't think Brexit or Trump would happen, so you probably shouldn't listen to any of my prognostications about these things. Um, so one alt-right meme warrior who I found on Reddit published a helpful, if a bit vague, series of flowchart how-to guides on how to use memetic warfare to pursue their ideological goals. So the first thing is that you examine the ideas you wish to introduce to society. Two, you define the ideas needed to support the previously defined idea. Three, you ask the question, were there any supporting sub-ideas to define? If the, question, if the answer is no, then you've completely defined the memetic structure you wish to propagate, and you move on to the next one. So this is the memetic indoctrination saturation chart. So number one, 
introduce undercover agents into the society you wish to infect with the goal ideas. Two, agents identify and indoctrinate community leaders that are already susceptible to infection with the nomadic structure of the goal ideas. Number three, <coughs> agents use indoctrinated community leaders to spread the nomadic structure of the goal idea to their subordinates and followers. Four, agents leverage uh, indoctrinated community leaders and their subordinates to place pressure on non-conforming leaders and their subordinates to accept the nomadic structure of the goal ideas. Five, if possible, agents identify and eliminate leaders and subordinates that are resistant to their new mimetic structure. Six, you ask the question, is there now a majority of community leaders and subordinates with the same goal ideas? Yes, then mimetic indoctrination point has been reached. And you move on to the status monitor. So meme operation status monitor. One, identify a member of the target community not already indoctrinated with the goal ideas. Two, can he or she be indoctrinated via pressure from indoctrinated members and leaders in the society? Three, does he or she pose a threat to the spread of the goal ideas? Four, can you eliminate him or her without spreading the spread, dis sorry, disrupting the spread of the goal ideas? Five, monitor, eliminate, or indoctrinate them. And I have to admit, I don't exactly know what monitor, eliminate, or indoctrinate means in this case, but <laughs> use your imagination. So I think, the key thing here about the Overton window is just by engaging with or attempting to refute these ethno-nationalist insanities through rational discourse or even with violent reaction, you're giving the ideas agency, you're stretching the Overton window of what is considered acceptable to discuss, and you're shifting the metapolitics from what is once the unthinkable into governmental policy. So conspiracy theories are like memetic viruses. Once they infect public discourse, it becomes basically impossible to fully repudiate them. Studies have shown that people who believe in conspiracies are innately biased toward the information which supports that conspiracy, no matter what the evidence says. And moreover, people who believe one conspiracy are statistically much more likely to believe other conspiracies, even if they're completely unrelated ideas. And most frighteningly of all, a mere exposure to a conspiracy theory, regardless of how seriously you take it, subconsciously makes us more susceptible to them. So memes and conspiracies are basilisks. Mere exposure to them is harmful. It seems like the dominant tactic on the left on reacting to the rise of neo-fascism lately is the idea of no platforming. So basically protesting, heckling, or otherwise disrupting the gatherings, lecturings, rallies of right-wing ideologues. And I totally understand the motivation. After all, if these memes are basilisks, it, it is best to not let anyone be exposed. But I find that the sentiment often directly contradicts the Streisand effect and has counter, counter effective goals. So, for instance, LV50, as I'm sure you've all heard of, was a tiny gallery space with basically no profile. Even my friends, who knew friends who showed there, didn't know about it. So after being no platform, the gallery was featured in The Guardian, The New York Times, Al Jazeera, Freeze, etc. So what did this accomplish? So they shut down an insignificant young gallery, and then a few days later, an actual fascist triggers Article 50. This seems like missing the forest for the trees to me. So the method that I'm much more inclined to use against neo-Nazis is analogous to a vaccination. Getting too sucked into the material that I'm researching increases the chances of getting red pilled by it, I think. After all, YouTube algorithms are designed to take you down the rabbit hole, and suggestion algorithms radicalize people. However, a small amount of toxic substance taken under a controlled environment inoculates you of the pathogen, so maybe like in a lecture. I'm struck by this anecdote about a black American R&B uh, singer named Daryl Davis. So he befriended dozens of Ku Klux Klan members, and by slowly engaging with the Klan members, he was able to eventually persuade more than 200 of them to leave the group, including the Grand Wizard, who gave him the robe which Davis is proudly displaying in this image. Davis says he thinks it's important to let these people have a platform so they don't feel even more disenfranchised and edgy, uh, to engage with them in dialogue and reflect the hypocrisies of their beliefs and let them work their idiotic ideas out themselves. Recently, I heard an interesting quote by uh, Irish author Angela Nagel, whose upcoming book about the alt-right Kill All Mormies I am eagerly awaiting. She cited an African proverb 
If you do not initiate your young men into the tribe, they will come back and burn down the village just to feel the heat. I have a sense that a substantial portion of these kekis are just young beta guys who feel like emasculated losers by the inability to meet the perceived expectations of a man's role in modern society. I kind of think many of them truly do just want to watch the world burn rather than go through the actual work needed to establish some kind of white chauvinist ethno state. That would presumably require a lot more effort than just shitposting memes. So I think calling these losers neo-Nazis or neo-fascists might almost be too charitable when anime Nazi is just so much more descriptive. That's not to say that some of them are not true believers, and I'm certainly not trying to argue to not take this threat seriously, but just maybe take some of the provocations of a grain of salt and remember that overreacting is exactly how trolling achieves strides and effect successes. So I'm often left in dismay at how clearly the left seems to be losing the battle of the right these days tactically. I think this sarcastic Facebook post sums up the exact distinction between our strategies, and it's also ironic considering the venue that we're in now. So I don't know if you can read it, but I guess you can. So the left, let's hold a panel discussion, workshop, seminar, and hope things change gradually while clinging to our quickly disappearing shreds of recognition, legibility, or power, the alt-right, LMAO, let's just use the primary tool of social organization available, tech, to rapidly mobilize forces, amplify flows, and infect other people quickly and efficiently. So, one recent political development, which I sort of accidentally coined on Twitter, uh, <laughs> but I had little part in developing, is called Alt Woke. Um, the anonymous group Anon, LLC, which wrote the Alt Woke Manifesto, describes Alt Woke as the catalytic left, the post Landian left accelerationists, uh, the dark insurrection, direct action hacktivism, free market socialism, apocalyptic communism, intersectional xenofeminism, environmentally conscientious nihilism, libidinal Marxism, platform slacktivism, Internet of Things urban policy, high post post structuralism, the corporate undercommons, gratuitous neologism and nomenclature trolling, lifestyle branding as political ideology, and vice versa. So they advocate for hacktivism, slacktivism, agitprop internetism, nonlinear cyber warfare, and post ironic meme warfare. Basically, they want to take everything useful about the alt right's meme, alt right meme war tactics and deploy them for their own aims. I think one small example of this working is Wojak, who uh, is also known as Feels Guy, as a sort of kind of Bernie bro, alt-woke, anti-Pepe. Uh, and I actually know this artist and researcher, Matt Garrison, who is recently, he just completed a dissertation about trolling, which suggests this idea as well. And I think, although I don't know the details about it, he's collaborating with the artist Ed Fernielis on a project attempting to do just this. So I think maybe this is a millennial tactic which will actually gain some traction amongst the left in the 2018 American election cycle, and I hope so. I really think that millennials are the only way <laughs> the Democrats have any hope. So, uh, <laughs> what's the deal of all the contemporary interest in these chimeric beasts, <laughs> emotive amphibians, libertarian snakes, reptilian shapeshifter overlords? How about Trump's promise to drain the swamp, which beyond being laughably implausible, seemed to be a message that truly resonated with the American public. And to be honest, I actually, I really don't know why, other than there's clearly some kind of notable synchronicity going on here, and I'm certainly open to hearing some of your theories about why this might be in the Q&A. So, in conclusion, it was said that the man who finally slayed the Basilisk of Warsaw did so by wearing a black leather suit covered by tinkling mirrors, ref reflecting the Basilisk's toxic gaze back at itself, turning it into stone. So can we use a similar strategy, holding up a mirror to the alt-right and defeating them using their own tactics? I admit, even I am a little bit skeptical that this is possible. I, I wonder, is, is post-ironic shitposting an inherently chaotic and nihilistic act? Can it be used to build a positive future, not just so chaos? But one thing is for certain, the basilisk must be slain. And to conclude, here is, um, does the sound work? Does the sound work? No. <laughs> No, it's not in the word. No, okay. Like well, it's not that important, but it was just um, Alex Jones screaming like a demon, <laughs> which I thought was set the tone for the Q and A. So, uh, discounting that, let's just take some questions. I guess. Um, can you explain the confirmation bias? Like, 
Should we wait for the mic or does it matter? Uh, maybe it doesn't really matter. Maybe it doesn't matter. Okay, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Uh, you referred to the, I think we, you call it the confirmation bias. Yeah. I just I don't know what that is. So um, it can mean a lot of things, but confirmation bias basically, let's say you look at a past result. It's like, it's like look 20, it's been, okay, I think hindsight is 2020 is the perfect synonym for that. So confirmation bias in the case of Cambridge Analytica that I mentioned was, yeah, that all those candidates won, but from what I've read recently, actually, like they didn't even deploy a lot of the things they said, and it's really just this marketing campaign. So I think it's it seems like they were effective because of this sort of confirmation bias. That's what I meant. Um, why do you think that it was a good idea to talk about Roku's database when like uh, it does impact everyone else? Like, what made you think of that? Um, well, I was thinking about basilisks and about inherently harmful ideas. Um, I was already thinking about Roko's Basilisk, and actually I forgot to mention this, but I should plug. Uh, the curator, Aaron Moulton, is having a show called The Basilisk, uh, which is taking place, I forget the date, I'm messing up here, but in LA at Nicodem Gallery. And actually in relation to that, he invited me to interview Roko himself, who is available on Facebook, but is a little bit reticent to uh, communicate. But to get to your point, um, I don't really believe in it. Uh, I think it's a very interesting idea. At the same time, I guess I overall agree in the need of a benevolent, strong AI. So if you guys want to donate to the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, by all means, do it if you feel guilty. Right, it was, um, I forget the name of that, but yeah, that was, it was in between sort of uh, Pascal's wager and then this idea which came first, which was about an alien offering you a box with a thousand bucks or a thousand or a million, and if you decide, yeah, I forget the details of it, honestly, I should probably know better than you, but yeah, that, that was the precursor idea that you were right, so, um, and that's interesting. Yeah. I have a question which is just about this, this like left and right, you talk about the left, and do you think that kind of terminology still makes sense in the sort of meme context and or like oh. the new populism? That's a, I think that's a very good question. I mean, I sort of have noticed what I would consider sort of pool shift in politics, where sort of old alliances have broken down and new ones have formed. I can, I think that the sort of, uh, the fact that, I don't know, defending free speech at all become, you, you have to sort of preface it with saying, I'm not a free speech zealot, but um, I think that sort of shows a sort of an illiberalism on the left that's, that's forming, and of course that exists on the right. So, I don't know, a perfect example is like, I don't know, do you wanna be on the left and be the same type of person who wants his Christ taken down? Like, I don't really think that's the winning side of history. So, yeah, maybe left and right don't map so easily to this. And maybe even the four axis grid doesn't map. Um, I actually really like this meme that Sean Monaghan used, which was based off of the Dungeons and Dragons one, where it's chaotic, neutral versus uh, evil, good, uh, or really good. I think that's maybe more effective just because there's nine points. But yeah, good question. Uh, anything else? Go, you're first, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I avoided mentioning that so far. Um, so, no, 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 I don't mind, I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, and I have to admit, uh, I trolled a little bit. So I gave a different version of this talk uh, at the Steg like last week. Um, I added some content here just for you guys, so don't worry. But uh, I actually did start that talk by uh, formally denouncing LD50 and their, any affiliation with it, and uh, also endorsed the shutdown LD50 movie. Movement, just because no one asked me to do it in uh, in order to give the talk. So I think no platforming doesn't work very often, basically. So yes, uh, the Goldsmith students were uh, unfortunately denied the pleasure of hearing me speak. Great. Um, I don't know. 
Uh, and because of that, I got to write an article in Freeze. I am giving this talk here now, which was offered because of that controversy. I think there's actually something that's called the Cobra Effect, incidentally also about reptiles, which is sort of just the idea of unintended consequences, like the butterfly effect or something. I think that's very often what happens with the attempt of the platforming. Um, I think this Whitney Biennial thing is a perfect example. You have one maybe. I just wondered how does all of this in your in your experience, how do you think it affects the art world or being an artist? Um, I don't care about art very much these days, <laughs> I'll have to admit. Um, I think I am an artist by basis of like what I've been doing for 10 years and by the sort of social networks which I operate in. But um, even for the last 10 years, art was always like sort of the least uh, interesting thing to me. And the only thing that was interesting was trying to bring in these sort of ideas from other bodies of knowledge into the art world. So I think there is obviously something to do with aesthetics and uh, the power of images here. And I, I would argue that memes, well, maybe memes and prestige TV are sort of the only uh, visual mediums that still have any agency anymore. And I, I think the idea of I don't know, showing a painting in a white cube wall when Pepe memes are deciding elections, it just seems so solipsistic and tiny. It's hard for me to care about that. Um, so I don't know exactly what artist role if making art could, could have to change politics. I think it'd be better to be more directly involved in politics, actually which is not what I'm doing here, but um, it's what I dream of doing, maybe. Mm -hmm. Is that it? <laughs> Any more questions? What's wrong with Bernie, Bernie Bros? What's wrong with Bernie Bros? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, you, you use the term Bernie Bro, and it's kind of like- uh, I did use a Bernie Bro. You know, and uh, <laughs> not a, okay, yeah, Bernie Bro is the same. It is a thing. They were, <laughs> what? They were like right. If they had won, I think Bernie would have won. I'll say right. That. If uh, if Hillary didn't, I was not a Bernie bro, him. but I think he Bernie would have won. won. Yeah. Well, his obviously his economic message and his uh, um, appeal to the Rust Belt that that was decisive. At the same time, I do think that the Bernie bro, even if it's a derisive term, it definitely described a certain type of specifically internet uh, user base first period of time, so I don't know, that's why I used it.